Uh, and for those that have already logged in, I guess uh, we can at least say welcome to one of the imaging workshops or symposiums that we've been holding at the, in the Med Center here for at least 10 years now uh, in conjunction with uh, a lot of Texas Cancer Center money from CPRIT, the acronym uh, that has established a really good high throughput screening lab that has always from the beginning had high content involved uh, that we've been feeding them and then developing their own uh, over the years. And the newest CPRIT grant from a few years ago of mine, uh, that's really all imaging. And that's the status of the, uh, the funding and why we're doing these. Uh, the round table here is to provide top level uh, presentations uh, from people that do high content analysis, uh, both Beth Cimini from the Broad Institute in Boston and Fabio, who's been in my group here for about 11 years now, amazingly enough. Uh, we're going to have, as stated here on the agenda on the right, we're going to have a QA and a uh, session at the end. Uh, if you have questions during the, the either talk, you're free to post them as a chat, and that, that way they'll be recorded and then we'll bring them up at the end or stick around and, and ask questions directly. Uh, the first speaker, as I said, is Beth. And the reason Beth is here is that she's been leading one of the preeminent academic uh, open source software packages uh, from the Broad Institute. And she's in Ann Carpenter's lab that actually <laughs> Fabio and I have some uh, connections to from some years ago as well. Uh, Beth is gonna talk about getting the most from your microscopy images with high content uh, using cell profiler and morphological profiling. And remember uh, questions in the chat and, and stick around at the end for the Q&A. So go ahead there, Beth. Just... I gotta stop my ass right. Mm -hmm. You guys can see my slides okay? Yep. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, as Mike mentioned, I'm from Ann Carpenter's group at the Bird Institute. Um, I run the image assay development team or the image analysis team in her lab. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you guys today about some of the work that we do in using cell profiler to advance high content imaging and uh, really make morphological profiling feasible and uh, work well. So I hopefully don't have to convince this group too much that uh, images contain a wealth of information. Um, one of the things we talk about in our lab is trying to get images to be just as computable as genomes. Um, and images have a tremendous amount of information. Um, and again, the, the because of the history of microscopy, again, it's still not thought of as, as, qual as quantitative of an image source as some other techniques, but um, the fact that you can work with it in so many different model systems, that it can be quantitative, that it can be multiplex, we find actually makes it, we think, probably the richest source of biological information out there. Um, and we're really passionate about trying to come up with better software in our group to come to better analyze and better extract all this quantitative information because uh, as wonderful as a machine as the human brain is, um, it's not a terribly good machine at quantification. Um, so when I first put up this slide, it probably looks to you like a color image. Uh, this is not a color image. This is a black and white image with some light colored lines overlaid. What your brain is designed to do is to find information fast and give you the idea of what's going on in front of you fast. Uh, it is not necessarily designed to do it in the most accurate fashion. And so uh, even when we have uh, really what we think are obvious looking biological phenotypes, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more more about that later. Uh, we really want to not use our brains. We want to use, use software to actually try and quantify some of these advancements um, in order to do really the, the best experiments that we can. And so in our lab, um, we work in two different modes. And I'm going to talk mostly about the second one. Um, a lot of the sort of history of microscopy, well, the initial history of microscopy was, of course, very descriptive. But um, certainly for the last 34 years, there was a lot of emphasis on find, having a known phenotype 
and measuring it and scoring it. Um, this is a Twitter meme that I found yesterday, but yes, the why don't I just fuse GFP onto the thing that I care about and sort of see where it goes. Um, I did certainly my fair share of this uh, back in the day. Um, and a tremendous amount of good biology has been done that way. And we work with a lot of different groups who are trying to do biology in that way. If you know a phenotype that you know you care about, whether it's something like infection, you know, certainly infectious disease assays have been relatively popular the last year, um, or a particular disease phenotype, of course you want to go through and try and, you know, develop uh, techniques to assess it. Um, and that's very valuable. And again, a way a tremendous amount of good science gets done. But we're, we feel that a lot of times it ends up with people leaving data behind on the table. Um, so this paper is a few years old now. I'm not sure how different it would be if we ran it today, but what, it, uh, what, we, what our lab found is that even for groups who say that they're doing high content screening, when they're talking about an image phenotype in high content screening, they were talking typically only about one to two cellular features. And the, I know what I want to find and here's where, how I found it. Um, if you look at people who use cell profiler, which cell profiler generates a lot of measurements, that balance is a little bit different, but it's not actually all that different. Most people are still talking about just a couple of features. Uh, but the average microscope camera these days is about 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. So it's 4 million square pixels every time you snap that camera. And if you have multiple Z planes or multiple channels or something, it's an awful lot of really quantitative information that frankly just isn't getting used very much. Um, and so uh, a big research direction from when my boss started the lab was basically what can we do with that information and how can we use that information not just to find our, our known unknowns, but also our unknown unknowns. How can we use it to discover biology we aren't, aren't even necessarily looking for and just see if we, we can get it to sort of fall out of the sorts of experiments that we do. And again, going back to the idea of what our brains are and aren't good at in terms of visual phenotypes, um, there's a lot of information that is in images that simply our brain does not have access to. Um, when I give this talk in person, um, I've always asked people, all right, so who wants to tell me which cell cycle phase all of these images are in? And I've never gotten a single hand up in having uh, asked a few different audiences for that. And that's because to our human brains, it's really hard to tell what cell cycle phase all of these bright field cells are in. Um, you could have maybe guessed that at, towards the end it was dividing, that this might have been a progression, but certainly if I just presented them to you out of order, it would have been very difficult for you to tell. But it's actually pretty straightforward if you use DAPI staining as a ground truth and then train only on bright field data for the computer to figure out based on very subtle changes and things like size and shape and texture, what cell cycle phase. And even when it makes mistakes, the mistakes that this algorithm is, or that this classifier is making are pretty sensible. It, sometimes it confuses S for G1 or G2, but again, this is a continuous process that we are sort of discretizing into bins so the mistakes that it's making are more an artifact of how we're how we look at this than anything else so it has a very good idea of the idea of the cell cycle and here's just a pretty spinning movie saying if we break things down by cell cycle phase and look at them in feature space the they're well separated in feature space by cell cycle phase and so this idea of information that our brains can't use and the sort of amount of quantitative data microscope cameras are starting to generate led our lab to this idea of morphological profiling. And the idea here is pretty simple. Um, you have your genetic or chemical perturbations, or now starting to see people do this in things like patient cell lines, um, put them all on a plate. Um, and this experiment can sort of be as small as just a few different cell lines, or it can be as large as hundreds of multi-wall plates. Um, we've worked in sort of lots of different scales with this. Um, throw them on your high content imager, take pictures, and then break down those pictures with image analysis to create a morphological profile that is just as many measurements of the cell as you can possibly get at a given time. And it's the richness of this data set and the pure number of features that we're looking at that turn out to be actually where the magic happens. Um, and you're actually able to start building up a very detailed profile of how all of the cells uh, in a given experiment are similar or are different to one another. 
Uh, the software we use to do this is called Cell Profiler, and probably you're you're at least familiar that it exists. Um, this slide is mostly just to show the the really awesome team of uh, folks who've been involved in writing it over the last 15 years. Um, it is always been a partnership between biologists who can code and actual professional software engineers, which I think helps make it so that it's both sort of very usable, but also flexible and understandable for biologists for doing the ex setting up experiments in the way biologists think um, and using the sort of terminology that biologists are used to using. Um, it looks like this, and I won't talk too much about it because again probably people are at least somewhat familiar with it but the idea is essentially this is an image analysis workflow tool masquerading as a program so images come in you can do things like identify cells or identify other objects and then you can add as many measurements as you want and that will be done reproducibly across every image in your experiment whether every image in your experiment is five or five million and the fact that we have these measurement module suites that we can add and that we can add a whole bunch of them in a pipeline pretty quickly means that we can pretty routinely get to hundreds, if not thousands of measurements, typically now on a cell paint, uh, on our major profiling assay, which we call cell painting, which I'll introduce more in a minute, we average about 5,000 features per cell. Um, and that comes from things like sizes and shapes, uh, textures, granularity, the correlation between any channels that are there. And again, just sort of measuring this, but measuring it not just in one or two features, but in thousands of features, turns out to yield really, what was surprising to me when I first came across this, uh, this approach, really surprisingly amazing results. Um, so this was sort of the first paper that even uh, demonstrated, one of the first papers anyway, that demonstrated that profiling could work. Um, so this was a, a data set of a number of compounds with known mechanisms of action, and the cells were stained with a DAPI stain, an actin stain, and a tubulin stain. These are stains that we don't think about as being sort of very fancy or very special, it's just sort of showing us what the compartments of the cells are. And what they wanted to know is, could you actually break, regroup the drugs into their mechanism of action classes just based on a nuclear stain, an actin stain, and a tubulin stain? And it turns out that you can, um, and that in fact, with the nucleus alone, without even the actin or tubulin stains, you get 67% accuracy. When you throw in all three stains, that accuracy jumps to 94%. And again, even the mistakes it does make, make sense. DNA damage and DNA replication are extremely interlinked processes. So it makes sense that some would be confused between one and the other. So this says that even though most of these categories don't have anything particularly to do with the, the stains that we're using, protein synthesis and protein degradation don't have anything specific to actin or tubulin, um, that this could be a general approach. Um, and so this isn't work from our lab, but this spawned a pharmaceutical company called Re Recursion Pharmaceuticals. And again, sort of really sort of showed that this was an approach that could work in, in a real human disease context. Um, a group at Univers Bennett University of Utah uh, did an experiment where they had a knockdown that caused a disease uh, phenotype for cerebral cavernous malformation. And the visual effect on the cells when you have this is a really striking visual phenotype. Uh, and so what they said is, all right, we have a knockdown that we know comes from a disease. It causes you know, a, an imaging phenotype. Can we use drugs on our knockdown cells to actually make them look more like the healthy phenotype? Um, what was really exciting then is because of this striking visual phenotype, they're able to get both human experts and uh, using a morphological profiling approach to determine which drugs created the most healthy like cells and then gave the mice drugs that had either been picked by the human experts or by the computer. And it turns out the humans didn't do anywhere near as well as the computer uh, in terms of selecting drugs that truly approximated the healthy phenotype. Maybe because our eyes are drawn to something like the redistribution of one of the stains as opposed to subtle changes in the shape. And the, the subtle changes in the shape actually turned out to be most important. But in any case, even when we think that we can tell what's going on in the cells, morphological profiling is picking up information that our eyes simply don't. And so this led our group along with Stuart Schreiber's group at the Broad to develop what we call the cell painting assay. And this was designed to essentially allow you to cram as much visual information uh, into a standard imager as cheaply as possible and as easily as possible. 
Um, so these use dyes that you probably all have sitting in the back of your freezer, things like MitoTracker and Concavalin and Hooks, to try and outline with stick stains eight different compartments of the cell so that we can measure those even more richly than in the original sort of proof of concept, which was only three channels. The idea being, if we can just see as many parts of the cell as possible um, in a way that's pretty agnostic as to what we're studying, we can actually learn, we hope, quite a lot of biology in a way that's very undirected. And so one of the first really exciting results we had from this was using overexpression of uh, different ORFs, open reading frames, um, from a whole bunch of different disease pathways and mechanism of action pathways. And so zooming in just on one part of this clustergram, here you can see we have a bunch of members of the RAF and RAS pathways that are all being grouped together by their cell painting imaging signature. And we have the, we had two two different copies of the ORF in uh, many of these. And we see that the, that the duplicates are matching together nicely. And we see that we have the wild type protein right next to some considerably activating proteins that are nonetheless in a separate cluster. And so the cell painting is specific enough not only to sort of figure out what is in the same gene overexpression pathway, but how is it slightly different in a disease causing mutation? And so we were really gratified to see this. And so Mohamed Roban, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time and now has his own lab, um, looked at this and started looking at the connections between all of the different gene pathways that were present in this experiment. And a lot of them made sense and were things that people already knew, which is gratifying. It's good to know that you, know, you can discover known biology. But in looking through the different pathway to pathway associations, he found at least one pathway that was not known before, which was an anti-correlation in the cell painting space between NF kappa B and the hippo pathway. And when we talked to biologists who work in that area, they were like, there's no, there's no knowledge that these two things should ever interact. Um, and so they were kind enough to build us a reporter gene. And obviously I'm telling you the story, so <laughs> you can probably guess how it turned out. Um, that when you overexpress NF-kappa B pathway members, hippo reporters go way down. So we we're able to discover novel pathway-pathway biology simply from saying those cells look anti-correlated in the cell painting assay, which again is not targeted toward any one particular area of biology. Um, we're starting now to move into, into patient cell line. This is work that's currently being led by Marzia Higigi in our group. Um, and what we have here that's very exciting is uh, patient cell lines from case, patients with different psychiatric disorders or who are controls. Um, and these are cell lines made from skin fibroblasts. And these are just fibroblast lines. These are not neurons. Um, I believe the idea was originally to sort of do the fibroblast first as proof of concept and then move into neurons. But what we found is that with cell painting, there are actually a number of psychiatric disorders that we could see just in skin, skin fibroblast cell lines. There are populations of cells that are missing in certain ones of these disorders or that are overrepresented in certain areas in these disorders. Uh, and that is potentially really exciting because of course it's a lot easier to get a skin biopsy from someone than a brain biopsy from someone. And uh, we're working now to see if we can understand how this works, why this works, is this reproducible, but um, we've got very good evidence that we can see based on certain cellular phenotypes, uh, things that relate to psychiatric conditions. Um, I wanna emphasize though that for the features that are turn out to be really distinguishing between controls and the different disorders, these are things that we could not have discovered without this approach. So these are high scores and low scores for that particular uh, measurement, which I unfortunately can't tell you what it is right now because this is still unpublished work. And I've been looking at images professionally for many years now, and they all look the same to me. I couldn't tell you necessarily what's different between the, the cells on the left and the cells on the right, but the cell painting approach can, and it turns out that um, it, you can find some really striking behavior, even if you're not in the right cell type. Um, so how can we push this even further? Um, all of this is great and we're very gratified that a lot of this has worked, but um, we, what we wanna know now is how can we extend this approach and use it to find even more biology? So can we capture more data? Um, so 
this is ongoing work uh, with Nicholas Riveron's lab in the Netherlands, uh, being led by postdoc in my group, David Sterling, uh, looking at cell painting in 3D blastocysts. And we're trying right now to figure out the right staining conditions and then the right analysis conditions to be able to extend cell painting, not just to 2D cells growing on plastic, but also to cells that are in a 3D structure. Um, Hamda Abbasi, who used to be in my image analysis group and then moved into Shantanu Singh, who leads our profiling team, uh, moved into their group, also did some work with Muhammad looking at, um, looking at heterogeneity and whether or not it can improve profiling performance. Um, most of the, everything I've told you about so far has been based purely on looking at per cell means or per well means or medians of cells. And as anybody who's spent a lot of time looking at cells knows, um, cells can be very heterogeneous, even when they're suffering under a strong phenotype that you've induced in one way or another. And so what uh, it took a, a while to actually find a technique that would improve on just mean or median. We tried a lot of them and a lot of other groups tried them and uh, couldn't really come up on anything improved on mean and median. But what we did find is that when we looked at the covariance of how different features change and uh, use similarity network fusion to add that to the mean profiles, that that could, for certain experiments, actually improve prediction value a lot by saying not only how has the mean of the cell changed, but how has the, say, variation between how two stains talk to each other and, say, size. So, so two features that might not seem correlated, the correlation between those could actually help improve prediction. And so this is work that's still actively ongoing. Um, Right now, um, all of this depends on first, I said, finding the objects with cell profiler. And so one thing that we, we always wanna know is can we do a better job with that? Um, so you'll hear me talk about Juan Caicedo a lot for the rest of this presentation. Um, he used to be, he used to lead the deep learning team in our group and now is a Schmidt fellow at the Broad uh, running his own group. But uh, he led this uh, to, this effort to sort of bring a lot of deep learning into our workflows and sort of see if we could optimize any of them. One way in which we've done that is by trying to find nuclei and find cells. Um, obviously you don't need deep learning for this. This is something we've been doing computationally for a long time, but uh, he led a team that it turns out that when you try to train a nucleus predictor based on what, what parts of the image are background, what parts of the image are the centers of nuclei and what parts of the image are the borders of nuclei? And that part turned out to be in fact quite important. Can you actually create a predictor that helps you nicely identify nuclei even when cells are bigger or smaller or lumpier because of the various phenotypes you're studying? And what Juan found was that um, using this and training what's called a U-net, which is just a kind of neural network that has a shape sort of like a U and that the net layers get smaller and then larger again, um, does a really good job compared to a, a basic cell profiler pipeline or even an advanced cell profiler pipeline made by someone who makes cell profiler pipelines for a living. Um, there are certain classes of, of error that certain are just common to uh, conventional image analysis, such as two things as a cell being split in half or two cells being merged together that with this uh, nuclear boundary approach that a couple of different deep learning methods are just not as prone to. Um, and it takes a while to sort of generate this ground truth and train it. Um, but once you've done that, it's actually just as fast, if not faster than doing it the old school conventional way. And so this, is, this has existed now as a cell profiler plugin. Um, but we weren't really happy with that because again, that whole, you have to sit down and train it. Um, and we didn't want people to have to do that. So what we did instead is we sat down and, and created a very, very large training set um, to create the 2018 Data Science Bowl where our lab basically stopped everything we were doing for a month and hand annotated 28,000 nuclei. Um, it took a while. <laughs> um, and then 4,000 teams competed for cash and prizes from our co-sponsors to try to find a general nucleus detector. Um, so the network I just mentioned works really well for nuclei stained with a certain thing and taken at a certain magnification, but the human brain can figure out that all of the images down here are images of nuclei. They're just taken with different dyes or at different magnifications. Can you actually train something that understands the sort of gestalt of the nucleus just as well as the human brain does? And so we challenged people to do it 
Um, and compared to the cell profiler reference, which was done individually for each class of image, not for each individual image, but for each class of image, we had several groups that did much better than even a cell profiler pipeline that had been designed for that style of image. Um, the idea being that what we see, hopefully we'll see in the future is that, um, you know, a, ha, rather than having your, your resident deep learning expert training a unit by hand and taking their time, or even uh, paying a self-profiler expert like me to, to design a pipeline for you, if we can create tools that just already understand what nuclei are and what cells are, with no configuration time needed, you can just run this through and get, and get the nuclear segmentations out. And so a lot of pieces of software are now starting to use this data set that we created uh, for the data science bowl to train new networks. It's being used in tools like Cellpose and Stardust. But um, one tool that we've collaborated with a bit is um, from Peter Horvath's group uh, called Nucleaizer. And you can just upload pictures of your, new, of your cells, and it will predict your nuclei and let you download them. And it's um, no other configuration needed other than an approximate size. Um, can we extract better features? So I've mentioned that we measure cells in about 5,000 different ways in our current cell profiler-based workflow. Um, and what Juan Caicedo uh, sort of proved to us in our group uh, was that um, in any case, a, these measurements that we have are just sort of for each cell is a particular feature up or down. And ultimately, until you get to sort of the very end and trying to figure out why certain things were different from one another, it doesn't really matter what you're measuring that's going up or down as long as it's going up or down consistently. And so could we use deep learning features, which are somewhat of a black box? Like if a particular deep learning feature doesn't necessarily represent something the human brain can understand, but as long as in the image space, it can understand that, you know, this relates to something like a texture, um, it creates the same sets of feature matrices that a conventional tool could, like Cell Profiler could. And so could we use the same sort of approach to actually do morphological profiling using deep learning based features instead of Cell Profiler features? Um, and so what Juan did is an experiment that sounds kind of dumb at first, which is he trained a neural network for cells to guess what drug they've been treated with. And I say this sounds kind of dumb because we know what drug every cell was treated with, we treated it. Um, so in that case, we don't need, a, we never need a network that will have a cell guess which drug it's been treated with because that's, that's never a piece of information we won't have up front. But what it did do is then once we knew that the cells were, that that network was well-trained and the cells were doing a good job of predicting their own drug treatment, we knew we had a network that could, that knew a lot about how different drugs change the visual appearance of cells. And so we can take the individual layers of this network and turn them into a feature matrix. And, even, and we don't need this end, this end training but we know it gives us a network that we know actually contains uh, nodes that predict uh, cell response to drugs in images. And so this is what's called a weakly supervised approach. Um, since we're not, we're not discreetly bending the cells into classes, we're just sort of learning the classes um, by teaching the cells to predict something different. And so if this works, we've found in a couple of different ways. If we overexpress different genes, um, the different genes separate out nicely in this TISNY plot based on which gene, based on these deep learning based features. And the experiment I told you about at the very beginning, the three stain experiment where um, we had 94% accuracy and was sort of one of our first proofs of concept that morphological profiling worked um, using this weekly supervised approach, one can get 97% accuracy and he can get it 700 times faster. Um, so this is really exciting. And again, we, you, you lose the sort of ability to take some of these features and figure out why cells look different from one another, but you certainly can't argue with that it works. And so um, Juan is now leading a tool that we call Deep Profiler that's designed to take cells and run them through this sort of a workflow in order to do morphological profiling based on these kinds of features. In just the last five minutes, I wanna talk about sort of the kinds of new experiments that we imagine coming from this now that we know that this approach works and we have a few different ideas about how we can carry it out. 
Um, one is just to customize cell painting for whatever cell type you care about. Um, the, the magic in cell, in cell painting and in morphological profiling is just in the measuring lots of features. It's nothing particular about the cell painting dyes. Um, and so we've been working with different groups who have particular biology that they care about to customize the panel a little bit to say, all right, if it's really important to you to have one particular dye in there, we can drop one out and swap another one in. And so um, this is work that's in preparation with Melina Klausnitzer at the Broad, um, looking at how changes in adipocyte maturation happen with a slightly altered cell painting panel. And you can start thinking about virtual experiments that you can do with this. If you create enough cell painting data where you have, say, genes that are overexpressed or knocked down and compounds that are being used for treatment, you can start trying to match one experiment to another and say, does the, does the uh, overexpression of a particular, of a particular gene anti-correlate with something that's known to be an inhibitor of that gene? And we're starting to get some preliminary that's where this is true. It turns out this is computationally not trivial, but um, it's, it's a promising area. Um, another promising area is in being able to sort of connect other experiments to cell painting and maybe make some other kinds of experiments that are harder or more onerous to do, not necessary, if we can predict how they would have come out using cell painting data. So Greg Way is a postdoc in our group who sort of took this long sort of long delayed project and carried it over the finish line where we took um, a set of treatments and did both a cell cycle panel, a cell viability panel, and a cell painting panel. So we could know particular things that different treatments were causing, you know, are they causing cell death? Are they causing changes in cell cycle phase? Um, are they, if they are causing death, is it a particular kind of death? Is it apoptosis versus something else? And then compare that to the cell painting and see if we can train a regression model to see, uh, do we see a signature in the cell painting experiment that correlates really nicely with one of these, what we call cell health phenotypes, again, things like viability. Um, and it doesn't work all the time, but when it does work, it can work really nicely. There are some things, um, maybe not surprising, is that things like shape tend to do better in sort of cross-correlation between the two uh, models, whereas some things like uh, DNA damage or react reactive oxid oxygen species are harder to predict purely from cell painting because we don't have a particular marker for those there. But it's proof, proof of principle that um, you can actually use these cell painting experiments to replace other experiments or to at least give you an idea of how other experiments turn out. And so you can do a sort of smaller set of the really hard to do, really expensive experiment, and then a lot of cell painting, which is designed to be cheap and easy. And so because of this, Anne has done a truly remarkable thing, which is create a consortium that uh, uh, that 10 different pharma companies are working with us to create the world's largest uh, cell painting data set. Uh, I need to update the slide. The release date has been pushed back a bit with COVID. It'll be out in November of 2022. But to have uh, tens of thousands of genetic perturbation and hundreds of thousands of compounds in a publicly available set where then you can query against it and maybe not have to even do that first cell painting experiment yourself, but just query your compounds or your genes of interest against it and uh, get an idea of how you, what compounds or genes you should prioritize for your biology. Uh, I'm going to skip these last couple slides because I'm at the end of time, but we are working on doing this in a pooled approach as well um, so that we can combine this with in-situ sequencing so that we can do this rather than, you know, 384 well plates in large plates with lots of different, uh, with lots of different genetic perturbations all at the same time. And that's work with Paul Blaney's and JT Neal's groups at Word. And so with that, I've talked about a lot of cool work from our lab, uh, most of which was not done by me, was done by this amazing group of people. And would like to thank the collaborators who take all of these pictures. We're a dry lab. And so all of these pictures came from somebody else who did the hard work of making them and the people who funded it and you guys for your attention. Thank you. The round of virtual applause is going on. You can't hear it, but it's there. Uh, we are right at uh, the last couple of minutes here for the first half. So how about questions coming at the end for uh, after Fabio's talk? 
and we'll do them both together. Take it away, Fabio. Yes, sir. Can you guys see it? Yeah, works. Excellent. Looks good. So uh, actually, uh, you know, thank you, Beth. It was a fantastic talk, and it actually covered a lot of things in a way uh, that we are also doing. And actually, I'm going to go the other way around. So Beth showed you the beauty of doing as many measurements as possible across of millions of conditions. And what I want to spend time today talking about is actually focusing on one feature only, which is of course the uh, death nail for me talking with Beth today. But uh, what we're trying to understand here as a group is how reproducible is this feature across multiple experiments? And can we use this uh, as a metric for what we're interested in, which in our case is uh, estrogen receptor modulation. So the concept is the concept of nature. I mean, nature is inherently heterogeneous. And that's not, not just talking about genetics here. It's just really uh, genetically identical organisms like bacteria are in incredibly phenotypically different. And so, and this uh, phenotypic heterogeneity transitions at all scales of biology from macro to nano. So from a uh, population to single individual allele uh, gene transcription, which I'm gonna touch upon at the end of my presentation. So why? Why do cell, why are cells different? Uh, why are we all different? You know, what's the rationale? And of course, I wish I had an answer for this, but most likely it's just entropy and noise of, you know, biochemical reactions that elicit uh, random events that cause small variation in the system. However, this poses a very important advantage of a population sensing changes in its environment and thus has an evolutionary advantage. So this makes it important to us to study and ask the following questions. Can we quantify it? And that's obviously yes. <laughs> As Beth showed, you know, we are very good at quantifying a lot of features from single cells. But the mo most, que most important question that we tackle is, is it this phenotypic heterogeneity reproducible? Or if it's totally random, it shouldn't be reproducible, right? And then if it's reproducible, can we exploit it to measure in our case, uh, environmental toxicology uh, based chemicals. So in, for this, I spent two seconds in introducing our model system, which is the estrogen receptor. Estrogen receptor comes in two flavors, alpha and beta. It's a master uh, gene regulator uh, of many, many of about 10% of the transcriptome in its target tissues. And it's linked to many diseases, you know, most famously breast cancer. And for that has been targeted by a lot of different classes of chemicals with all possible disparate structures from you know, pharmaceutical drugs to uh, uh, chemicals produced by you know, uh, pollution and other uh, industry, but also uh, natural products uh, known as phytoestrogens. Most famous would be the soybean uh, isoflavones like genistein, for example. I'm not gonna spend time on the mechanism because I'm not gonna touch upon that, except showing you that when you look at you know, cells expressing estrogen receptor, just shown here on the upper right, you can see that in, in the, this is a high mag uh, image. You have some cells that have a lot of it and some cells like the one with the green arrow that have very little of it. So how do these cells respond? And why is this, this variation can we quantify? So what we set up doing uh, with an enormous effort in the group, uh, that we had you know, four or five uh, people working on this for the last two, three years, uh, is you know, let's take images uh, of a lot of cells as much as we can, or not as many, depending on what you know uh, the day was going, how the day was going, and you know look at changing randomizing condition in our experimental con uh, uh, you know, situation, like passage number of the same cell line, who actually is doing the experiment, day of the week, what type of vessel are we using, what type of antibody are we using, uh, what type of microscope am I imaging on, and what image analysis software we are using. So, and one of them, of course, is Cell Profiler, uh, which is what I use the most, <laughs> but we use other customized uh, software that we have in house. And as you can see from these four totally random images uh, of estrogen receptor in MCF7 breast cancer cells, every cell is slightly different. So, how do we represent that? And you know, in this case, we looked at uh, basically just a, a distribution plot across over, this is just about 30 plus experiments. Now we have about 50 of them. 
Well, all we did was just look at basal condition of these cells uh, under you know, random uh, experimental uh, days and see how they stack. And then, you know, Pankaj Singh in the group, who is a very talented mathematician, came up with his own quality control pipeline. So, so we can figure out is phenotypic heterogeneity reproducible? And if so, can we use it as a quality control so that we can call an experiment bad? And so we throw it away up front. And I don't want to, you know, talk about it in specific unless, you know, I, I'd rather keep this for the q and if somebody's interested, but basically it all hinges upon uh, some techniques to warp uh, our distribution and measuring distances by earth movers distance, which was the best way we found out uh, that would work. What I want to point out is that when we do hierarchical clustering of the EMD distances across 30 plus experiments, we really found three clusters. One was very, very large, and then we had one outlier experiment and few that were in a smaller cluster. That told us that in reality, we kind of have a ground truth in the distribution of ER levels across you know, years of work. Uh, and that was very encouraging because it also tell, told us that probably this uh, distribution is fairly conserved and it must have some rational behind it and probably some mechanistic uh, underpinnings that we're still trying to figure out. But like this, now we can actually use standard metrics like you know three standard deviations away from the median distribution to identify experiments that we would consider questionable. Now, we don't know why these are questionable. It could be because, you know, that day I woke up and I can screw up my antibody labeling. I don't know. But now we have a method to actually identify what is good in a sense and what is bad. And then Pankaj went on and did simulations on this type of analysis and found something that I think could be interesting for the community, which is really that uh, by the simulations you need, at least for this particular assay, again, every assay may be slightly different, but you need uh, a minimum of five independent biological replicates in order to approximate the ground truth of your single cell distribution. And we need to image at least about 500 cells per condition in order to faithfully reproduce uh, the shape of the distribution. So now, why did we focus on the R? You know, of course, for historical reason, both Mike and myself have been working on nuclear receptors for a long time. But also one of the cool things about estrogen receptors is that depending on the ligand that is bound to it, it's gonna change how the receptor looks. So in this case, we have three control compounds, two that are antagonists called ACI and 4-OHT that have completely opposite effects on the levels of the receptor in the cell. ICI degrades it, so it kind of disappears, and 4-OHT stabilizes it, so it will be higher. The endogenous ligand, which is 17 beta estradiol or E2, will also downregulate its receptor. This already can tell you that while this is attractive, it also has some limitations because both an agonist and antagonist will kind of show a similar phenotype. And so that, that's one of the reasons why orthogonal assays are always gonna be very important to define ligand character in the end. So as an example here, I'm showing, you know, again, a random image uh, of each of these treatments. And as you can see, what I told you uh, in words is kind of visually apparent. And then we can obviously show distributions to show that. And then we start looking at classical metrics that may describe, as Beth said, or not, or not you know, the heterogeneity of the situation. Median actually works quite well <laughs> in most cases, but sometimes in the IQR, you know, the uh, KS distance, or we use a lot uh, entropy-based metrics like quadratic entropy that was you know, spearheaded by a group in Pittsburgh uh, for this type of analysis. So we tested this hypothesis and Pankaj went on and created a second tier of uh, quality control for um, this type of analysis. And the first step was again, to use dynamic time warping to relate all treatments to its own vehicle control inside an experiment. So we could measure EMDs to uh, this, uh, you know, to the standard basically vehicle control uh, curve. And this way, in this case, uh, we can identify additional experiments where one or multiple ligands were not responding properly. And so now we have a two-tier quality control in this way that allows us to uh, just use the experiments that are more reliable. And this also applies to what people have used often as 
heterogeneity indexes. And these are some examples that people have used in the past. Uh, of course, fold median or uh, coefficient of variation and so on and so forth. And when we compared our you know, control compounds in this, uh, with these indexes, I think you can appreciate that some are better than others. Median is actually quite good, as you may imagine, because that's what we visually see. Uh, but you know, quadratic entropy is really good. And the EMD is has the highest dynamic range, but you lose, since it's always a positive distance, you lose the directionality of response. Uh, but other ones like, you know, coefficient of variation really was not informative uh, in this particular scenario. Now, let me spend two seconds introducing why everything is wrapped compounds are important. And that is because they're pervasive in nature. I mean, in the environment, we all are exposed by thousands of these compounds all the time. And so, uh, you know, EPA and NAHS and uh, the NCATS had this enormous uh, um, databases being built which are around the TOXCAST program that they use an enormous amount of uh, orthogonal assays to define these compounds and others, of course, uh, activities. However, interestingly enough, none of these assays are based on endogenous systems. So they are all uh, in vitro, purely in vitro or in engineer system. So can we now use an assay like what we are trying to develop with endogenous estrogen receptor in this case as a new biosensor uh, type of assay? And for that, I just showed you again our control compounds and those responses showing high sensitivity of, the, of our assay as the EC50s are either better or comparable to classical in vitro uh, assays like you know, ligand binding assay, for example. And this also corresponds to three canonical endocrine disruptors, dietyl bestrol, bisphenol A, and genistein. However, when you start looking at the ranking, which is here in red, of the endogenous receptor versus non uh, versus the toxicast assays, the picture is a little bit a mixed bag. For some compounds, our assay is very sensitive, and for others, not so much, which is another way of saying that you really need to rely on orthogonality to really you know, assess the, the true value of a compound or effect of a compound. And now I'm going to share you briefly a couple of uh, sets that we did. One is a 45 set compound or that, that was curated by the EPA containing agonist antagonists and inactive compounds from the estrogen receptor. And then a compound, a set with 42 compounds that have been selected based on environmental toxicology, meaning that they are really present in the United States at Superfund sites, and we have 42 of them. This is really not important in terms of the heat map. It's just to show you that we did you know, six point dose responses of all these 45 compounds, and these are three of the phenotypic indexes we looked at. What is more interesting is when we integrate our data with the uh, autoxcast values or the assays, we can identify a, a number of compounds that they call endogenous bias, which means that in the, in the, according to Toxcast, they are completely inactive. But when we actually look at uh, the estrogen receptor endogenously, they become active. And so these are, you know, and we can have reasons to believe why these are and why these aren't, and I don't want to go into the detail, but this also shows that by looking at endogenous receptors, you gain new information that you would have lost by doing only uh, in vitro assays. And this is just to show you an example of uh, four compounds on the left and two on the right that either we missed or we gained by the endogenous assay. Interestingly enough, the two missed compounds were missed because uh, they were active in toxicast only at concentrations that were higher than the highest we tested. So we probably you know, uh, would have gotten the same results if we went higher in concentration, which by the way is probably not environmentally relevant in any way. So these were sort of a set of unknown chemicals that we didn't know really what they would do. And uh, you know, just by glancing at the color palette, you can probably see that we didn't have as many hits as in the first set, which was of course a control set. But what was interesting that the hits that we had were kind of grouping into uh, chemical classes. So we have a couple of PAHs, a uh, few metals and pesticides that were all, uh, you know, they're all highly relevant in terms of uh, the environment. But again, we don't know what they do. We just know that they change estrogen receptor. So what are we really missing is a measure of activity. Because as I said before, estrogen receptor levels alone 
are not indication of activity of the receptor. You can have, and that's one of the biggest drawbacks of our assays that you know, a false negative would never be able to tell. Maybe something is very, is tremendously active, but doesn't change the receptor level, right? So that would be something that we'd never be able to tell. However, if something changes it, something is happening, we just don't know if it translates into a prior activation. And so for activity, uh, we look at single molecule RNA fish, and we use GREB1, which is the canonical via target gene. And with that, we can actually look at both nascent RNA, here represented in sort of, if you will, these yellow spots. There are four spots in MCF7 cells, which is a cancer cell, which has four copies of chromosome two. And then we can also count individual uh, mature RNAs as these little green dots all around. And so by doing this uh, type of assay with the new compounds shown here on the right, and if we look at this stack bar, bar graph where we uh, measure the fraction of the population that has either zero, one, two, three, or four active alleles, uh, firing at that particular moment, we can see that you know, of the PAHs, one was decently active, you know, not as active as estradiol, and the other one was really completely inactive. So even if it changed the estrogen receptor level, it didn't translate into activation of this canonical gene. So this is an interesting one, of course, because one, now we would be very interested in knowing what actually is turning on. Maybe it's turning on only a subset of target genes. We don't know that yet. And the same applies to the pesticides. We have two that are pretty decent, one almost inactive. And the metals were very interesting because they all can drop the estrogen receptor level. However, only cadmium was a little bit active, while both mer uh, mercury and, and chromium were inactive per se, but actually not shown here, they act as antagonists of the, estro of the of estrodiol. So, and then we can you know, finally integrate all that we have done and again, identify active compounds, especially specifically to our assay which was very, very interesting to us. What can we do next? Next is moving in a, in a similar way to what Beth said. You know, we increase the number of features we can look at. And one way of looking at this, since we are a nuclear receptor aficionados, is to do multiple IF labeling. And so this is an example of looking at estrogen, glucocorticoid, and androgen receptor at the same time. And then now we can see that there's a cloud of points that changes its position depending on the combination of ligands that you can add. And so can we use this to classify compounds? The answer is yes. Every single compound in a specific cell line has a specific cloud of points that you can actually then uh, quantify uh, in particular ways. But also we can tell cell types apart. And uh, just by, of course, this has to be, this is specifically linked to nuclear receptors, but you can imagine you can apply it to pretty much any pathways of interest you may have if you're interested in pathway specific analysis and not completely unbiased uh, mechanism like you know, Beth was talking about before. So uh, this is where we are moving in this direction. The last you know, two minutes of my talk is really about going to the smallest possible place, which is gene transcription. And I hinted at that already, but what uh, we published last year is that when you actually treat cells uh, with hormone, not all cells respond at the same time and not all alleles in the same cell respond at the same time and in the same way. And this can be you know, easily quantifiable. It's not gene dependent. It happens for all the target genes we looked at. And in fact, when you look at uh, two genes at the same time, just to keep it simple for this talk, there is no, very, there's no pattern. So the two genes do not act the same way in the same cell. So this is our new frontier for phenotypic heterogeneity that we are interested in the lab is, you know, of course, we're going multiple genes in the same cell that are targeted and try to find if there's a logic to it, or again, if this is a product of noise and stochastic activations in the nucleus or, or not. But this is just to finally say that, you know, we can follow phenotypic heterogeneity from organisms to single molecules, and all of it can be quantified uh, by imaging. So my final slide, of course, is to thank the whole team, Mike for first and Pankaj second, since he actually led mostly of the mathematical underpinnings of my presentation and the rest of the team for actually working really hard in creating all the images, all the thousands of images that we actually had to do for this particular project. And for who is in the audience, we are always looking for new projects. So anybody that's interested in cancer-related projects that require imaging and informatics, 
please contact Mike uh, and myself uh, directly. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Fabio. Clap, clap, clap. And if people have questions, uh, I haven't seen any show up in the chat, but now would be the time. One just showed up. Stan would like to know, when using AI, ML, or DL, do you have some general guide, guidelines for the size of the training sets you feel must be used to get reasonable predictions? Realizing that this is system dependent, but if there's some guidelines, maybe Beth? Yeah, um, I'm gonna say it depends, unfortunately. I think, honestly, what's What's a little bit less important is size than sort of heterogeneity. Um, in our experience, like it, the the amount of heterogeneity being involved is something that it really, uh, really is critical um, because there is a tremendous amount of variety in biology. We just all heard quite a lot about that. Um, uh, again, we when we were trying to train an incredibly general one, we did 28,000 nuclei. That was almost certainly overkill, but again, we were trying for something that was very generalist. I've seen papers nowadays doing, you know, sort of a, a few thousand, and I, I, I think you can certainly probably even get away with less depending on your, your augmentation strategies, um, but um, more is always better, but um, probably more important than just absolute, you know, 9,000 identical cells is um, a bunch, is a thousand cells that are really uh, varied. Okay, any other questions? Uh, now's the time, and if there are none, I can always ask questions. Not a Fabio, I know that story pretty well. Uh, but Beth, one of the things that as a center wishing to interact with people and get things done, what are the main uh, roadblocks in the earliest discussions with people that you find happening? Or is it always, you never know until you start talking, it's just random? That's a great question. And it's not one we actually get that often. I think a lot of times it's just getting people to understand really what their question is and just sort of getting them to know what are the kinds of tools that exist in the landscape so that they can pick what's best for them. A lot of times people, um, come to us, they're like, well, I want to detect, you know, how this marker moves in a cell. It's like, well, you know, is that the mean intensity? Does it matter, like, what the what the shape is as well? And sort of really thinking about, um, you know, if I had to say one measurement of a cell that's really critical to detect the biology that you care about in cases where we're not doing this, like, profiling approach. Um, in cases where, where you're doing the profiling approach, again, you can, you are, you're lucky that up front you don't have to pick a lot of measurements, you just sort of measure everything. Um, but then there are a lot of specifics about like numbers of controls and kinds of controls and, you know, how everything has to be plated that because, you know, the, the blessing and a curse of a very sensitive assay is it's very sensitive to lots of things, including maybe some things you wish it weren't. So one of the comments you made at the beginning about high content being one or two features, uh, that's always been puzzling to us that it was called high content when it, there wasn't much content. But now, and, and something that we've chased for a long time, uh, as many possible metrics as possible, as many colors as possible, then you start running into, if you're gonna screen something, how fast can it all go? So what have you been finding since you guys deal with uh, more companies than we do? Uh, what is the, the size of a high content screen in terms of that companies are doing. I mean, they're not doing 2 million compounds a day by high content, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But is there a sweet spot that they are aiming for that we could learn by? Um, yeah, so I, I think the companies have a few different, so again, like um, I, I didn't mention, but an experiment we had done working with Janssen, it was something where they did, you know, occasionally they will do 3 million compounds, but I, I think um, it very much depends, you know, they've sort of broken it down into different decks of, you know, this is the deck of things that we think are going to do phenotype A, phenotype B. For the self mutant consortium, we're targeting um, about 100,000 compounds at that scale. Um, which is certainly more than we, because we're, you know, academics could do, um, but each company is then, you know, doing one tenth of that. And so it, it 
it becomes feasible. Um, when, when we're sort of working well at Broad, we can do about 20 384 well plates a week, which is, you know, about 8,000 wells, which works out to, since we also find that five replicates are important, about 1,500 compounds once you take away replicates and controls. Um, and depending on, you know, what you have, what liquid handling and how many high content imagers you have access to, um, you can certainly scale from there. Those that are running that many compounds, are they running multiple machines? Or I they think just run them nonstop until they're done? I think they, my understanding is they run them nonstop just based on the fact that we've been having a lot of conversations about how to standardize microscopes um, across places. And it seems like most, they have, you know, one or two different, uh, different high content imagers, but, you know, screen A is always run on imager A and screen B is always run on imager B. Um, depending on the their setups, but um, yeah, we we just got a second one, so I imagine you know some of those companies may have two or three you know identical Opera Phoenixes or molecular devices, IXMs or whatever whatever's the cool new scope these days. I'll put a plug in for Yokogawa because because mm -hmm. we have one. Uh, it is remarkably faster than anything we've ever had. Uh, yeah, they, they definitely get better every year. Yes. Uh, that's an unfortunate part of all of this. The technology goes so fast and it goes faster than the money uh, mm -hmm. keep going. Uh, a question from a really great question uh, posted. To help an imaging neophyte, could you provide an idea of the pros and cons of image J versus cell profiler? And I'll expand that to really any software platform. Yeah. Image Ray is pretty amazing in a lot of ways, but yeah, Image Ray is great, and we work we work really closely with. Um, I, I, I didn't mention, um, but we we have a, a center grant that we work with Kevin Alisari, whose whose lab uh, keeps the Image Ray project going. Um, image Ray is a great um, image exploration tool. Um, it you can there's and with the addition of Fiji and the Fiji ecosystem, there are now so many plugins that you know probably somebody has written a plugin that does the exact analysis you want it to do. Um, where we find the imagery um, sort of falls down is in a couple different places. One of them is just because there are a million different plugins written by a million different people, sort of getting you know everything to talk nicely to each other um, can be a little anarchic. The other is just if you want to do the same exact analysis for lots of different things, you have to be comfortable with scripting. And more biologists are becoming comfortable with scripting, which I think is fabulous. I would love every biologist to learn to code at least just a tiny little bit. Um, but you shouldn't need to learn to code in order to do image analysis. And so Cell Profiler is designed to, again, like you can load in one image or one million images, and it's the same exact thing. It's not going to be as customizable as Image J, um, but reproducibility is baked in because you know what we save is the workflow file the pipeline file which is exactly what happened to all of your images and you know it's applied exactly the same across every image and so when i get a new data set from a collaborator i open it up in image tray first still even though i work on the cell profiler team just to sort of mess around with it and play with the contrast and see how it looks and you know maybe do test out some filters but then when i want to reproduce an analysis i go into cell profiler so profiler is also a lot easier to sort of work with in a cluster environment, although there's some advances with that in ImageJ, and we've actually written our own tool, which we're writing up a paper for right now, of being able to run ImageJ on AWS at scale. Okay, uh, any other questions? Oh, just one landed. Some of these profiles could be exquisitely time sensitive. Can you maybe discuss how temporal changes could be integrated into profiling? There are dosage changes, but what about what might be immediate versus long-term changes? From, from the context of the cell painting assay that we do, because it's a, it's a fixed assay, you can't really sort of look at it over time. I can say with compounds, we've looked at sort of 24 versus 48 hours and seen that in general, things are very similar. Um, let me pull up one of my... my bonus slides. Um, yeah, we're messed up. It's here. It is. Um, which is, you know, how, how could we maybe get away without having to fix the cells? Um, you want to share the screen? Yep, I'm pulling it up now. <laughs> 
um, which is um, we're starting to be able to get pretty good ability to predict um, some, some stains just from bright field. Um, this is still, you know, not something I would totally trust with my most sensitive data, but um, it's getting pretty good. And so there were a couple of papers that came out in 2018 that basically were almost the exact same paper, which was just we have a bunch of stained images and bright field images, and we trained them to try and predict the stain from the bright field. Um, one was from Google Accelerated Sciences and one was from Allen Institute. Um, and so the idea being, you know, you have your real fluorescence image, you have your real bright field image, and then you have your predicted fluorescence image. Um, and there's a pretty wide variety in sort of how well this works. Again, this was also three years ago, which in, uh, in deep learning time is like a thousand years. Um, so my guess is that this would be a little bit better today if they, if they redid it with some of the newer networks. But you could imagine trying to do some of these things now in live cells, like if you had an, an in cell that was in your, uh, in your, uh, in your uh, incubator and sort of trying to predict some of these and trying to do a sort of pseudo profile and then fix and stain at the end and basically see how close you got. Um, but otherwise you would need to either find some live cell dyes that are really well tolerated or um, you would need to do a sort of fluorescent protein line that had lots of different colors of fluorescent protein. Um, so we definitely know that some data can be gotten just from bright field, even without trying to do this fancy stain prediction. Um, we've done some work with label-free stuff in the imaging flow cytometry space, and there, there's absolutely information that you can get there. Um, but to sort of really you know, get a sense of what's going on in the cell, you want to see, you know, as many parts of the cell as you can. And this is the sort of approach that might help you get there a little more easily without having to engineer a sort of rainbow cell with tons of fluorescent proteins. Rudy, does that help with uh, your question? <laughs> He's nodding because he mm -hmm. was unmuted. Great, uh, one more question. And uh, this might seem uh, more to it than or less to it. Anyway, D, does 3D imaging mean imaging 3D cultures and organoids? The answer is yes, but let me refine the question a bit. When you're doing monolayer cultures, are you ever doing Z stacks for painting? Um, so we've looked at doing Z stacks with projection, and we found that we maybe saw a very small increase in sort of ability. We have a sort of, you know, uh, standard plate, um, a small ability to uh, increase in ability to sort of uh, match compounds on the standard plate, but it was like a 10% change for three times as long imaging. So um, we didn't really pursue that. Um, we've never actually done it in 3D just because 3D processing is so much more onerous. Um, but it's absolutely possible that particularly, we also typically image in wide field. If you were imaging in confocal with stacks and you had you know, a lot of really sort of sensitive 3D information um, that, it would, that you would gain information. It's just one of the long list of uh, things on our experiments to try list that hasn't hit the top of it yet. The 3D uh, Z stack movie that you showed of that organoid mm -hmm. was incredible. Yeah, that was a that was a blastocyst, um, and yeah, that's um, we're excited to sort of see how how cell painting works in that context. We're still still trying to dial in the the stain panel and get things that will you know work nicely and diffuse and all of that, but um, it should be fun. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, for Beth or Fabio? Don't be shy. Well, I feel weird asking Fabio a question. So. Yeah, don't ask me anything. I'll ask one to Beth, actually. There you go. <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, so what is, uh, I'm sure you looked at this a lot more than we have, uh, but Pankaj and I have always scratched our heads on the importance of signal to noise ratio across different replicate experiments and how does that influence your either neural net you know, analysis or just basic you know, profiling. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I mean, more signals, more signals typically always better. Um, because we're get cell painting and profiling, it's, you know, by nature, a very comparative assay, we're pretty much always normalizing to either the whole experiment or a set of negative controls. So you hope that you that you can get as much of that bias out as possible. But um, I don't know that we've ever sort of quantitatively gone through and either sort of added artificial noise or taken the same plate mm -hmm. and, you know, tried to tried to bleach it a bunch or take it at lower exposures. Um, we've tested sort of low versus high exposure at sort of a very extreme thing and again saw not a whole lot of change but um, that's also with the self-painting dyes that are super bright all of them other questions i had one but it just slipped away <laughs> <clears throat> If there are no further questions, then we can retire. And in doing so, thank you all for attending, and especially Beth and Fabio for participating with the presentation. Uh, I learned a lot myself. So take care, everybody. Bye bye. Okay.